Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Life Point. Whenever you're joining us, we just want to say welcome. My name is Holly, and I am your Missions and Next Steps Director. Thank you for joining us today. If you would, please take out your phone and join me on the Church Center app. There you will find all different ways to connect here at LifePoint with us. If you're brand new, go ahead and click on new, and we would love for you to fill that out so we can connect with you and get you fully connected here at LifePoint Church. We also have so many opportunities for you to take your next steps. Why next steps? Well, that's how you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ, as well as within your community. There are all, all sorts of opportunities here at LifePoint to connect, such as groups, events, classes, so join me on Next Steps and let our team help you figure out what those next steps are. Well, good morning, Life Point. So glad to have you here today. My name is Roy Conover, and I am the care pastor here at Life Point Church. So glad to see you, those in the room, as well as those of you who might be joining us online or watching this later. And uh, before we dive in uh, to uh, our teaching for this morning, I just want to stop and acknowledge you, moms. Happy Mother's Day. I hope that you have great celebrations planned for today with your family and with technology. I know it makes it easier even for family that's far away that you can connect uh, that way online. Uh, but I also know that today can be a challenging day. Not everybody has the greatest of relationship with their moms or with their parents. And so to you, uh, my heart goes out to you if you have that kind of challenge or maybe you're wanting to have a child and haven't been able to, or you're missing your mom for the first time this year or for many years, today can be a challenging day. And so what I want to do is just collectively give you a hug if you're struggling today, but all in all, my hope is, is that you're going to find some way to be able to celebrate with your family or with someone who means something very important to you. Now, we are continuing in our series of Bible in a Year, going through the entire Bible. We're finishing it up this month. We are in the book of Revelation. And if for some reason you would like uh, contact information for me, you can see that up on the screen. But as we're digging into this uh, latest and last part of our series, where we're saying, Dear Church, today we're saying, Dear Church, Know Your Enemy. Because in the book of Revelation, the apostle John on the Isle of Patmos exiled, and he is recording this vision that he has seen. 
And the importance of today and us talking about Revelation, we're going to be looking at the chapters 12 to 14. I know some of you would probably really want us to delve into whether we're talking about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I'm not getting into any kind of trib today. I'm really sorry. Not going to have time for that as it is. I'm going to be moving really fast to try and cover uh, what we're uh, talking about in these chapters. But before I get to Revelation, I want uh, to bring this one verse to your attention because I think it captures what we're going to be talking about today in knowing who our enemy is. We see it in the book of Ephesians. The Apostle Paul is writing to a church in Ephesus, and he tells them this in chapter 6, verse 12. He says, For our struggle is not against Uh, flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. And so as we are talking about knowing our enemy, it's important to recognize so often this has nothing to do with the physical. And just because we can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And we'll dig a little bit more into this as we progress along. Now, as we look at chapters 12 to 14, uh, you're going to see a cast of characters emerge. And what we see in these chapters is Satan, who is uh, described as a dragon. We also see the false Christ, also known as the Antichrist, the false prophet. We see the woman, we see the child, the 144,000, and the angelic announcers. Now, as we start in chapter 12, I want to refer to something as the unholy trinity. The first three characters that we see make up this combination of characters. So the first one is the dragon, and in Revelation chapter 12, we'll see several citations that I'm going to Uh, read to you that describe Satan. So the first one that we see in Revelation is this. Then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on its heads were seven crowns. So let me pause there. Uh, If you were with us last week, Pastor Kyle was talking to us about the importance of symbolism, and everything in Revelation is going to have symbolism. Some things are going to make sense, other things not as much sense. In this case, the heads are probably referring to mountains, and the horns are referring to kings or kingdoms, and we'll see more detail of that later in the chapter. But I do want to encourage you, if you weren't with us Last week, please go to our YouTube channel, look up that teaching because it sets the whole foundation for each week as we're diving into Revelation. But let's continue in this description of Satan. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail. And there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the world, he was thrown to earth and his angels with him. Now, remember, last week, Pastor Kyle was saying that revelation is not chronological. We don't just move through it methodically, like through the alphabet A through Z. Instead, it happens to build on itself, and we see patterns repeated over and over again, sometimes building in intensity. And this is what we're seeing here. So here we have this, uh, we have this notation of Satan and his angels being thrown out of heaven. This is happening during the tribulation. Not to be confused that earlier in the chapter, there was reference to Satan and his angels being thrown down from heaven, but that was actually before the creation of the world. And we know that Satan had access to heaven and to talking to God up until this point in Revelation 12, where he's thrown out for good. We know that because he has a conversation with God about Job. If you recall in Job, Satan and God are talking and he is wanting to accuse him and say that Job will give up on God if God were to allow him to be afflicted. So it's important to recognize these differences, right? It's not 
exactly chronological. Let's look at this last description of Satan that John is giving here in Revelation 12. So the dragon was furious with the woman, and pause there, the woman representative of the nation of Israel or anyone who is affiliated with uh, Jesus and God following after God. So the dragon was furious with the woman. He's been kicked out of heaven, right? And he went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commands of God and hold firmly to the testimony about Jesus. And so here, Satan is furious. He wants all the glory for himself. And so he is going after anyone who would align themselves with Jesus. And he is wanting to wage war. Now, let's just break down quickly because we've seen several instances of this already in Revelation 12, and that is there are different terminology for Satan. The first one, or, or different words re representing his character. Satan means adversary. He is going to come against us. The devil means accuser. And he is both wanting to accuse us and come against us, just as he did with Job. But you'll also, if you've read the Bible, know in 1 Peter, uh, the apostle Peter there is describing Satan as a lion, seeking someone who he could devour. And the apostle John in the book of John says that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. This is his way that he functions and his scheme, what he is after to try and get us. Now, so Satan was the first part of that unholy trinity. The second part of the unholy trinity we see in Revelation 13. So we're already moving on to the next chapter. And we see the beast of the sea in the first 10 verses listed there. We're not going to cover all of those, but just a few of the verses. So look at what John is describing in this vision that he is seeing. And he says, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had 10 horns and seven heads. On its horns were 10 crowns and on its head were blasphemous names. The beast I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. I know you want to get into all of this description and symbolism. Sorry, there's no time. The dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. One of its heads appeared to be fatally wounded, but its fatal wound was healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Remember, this is all happening during the tribulation. They worshiped the dragon because he gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war against it? Now, like I said before, way too much to unpack here. But what we want to see and recognize in this part of the unholy trinity, he is known as the Antichrist. He is a world leader that Satan is appointing and wanting to function in his place. In essence, this is how Satan is the grand manipulator, imitator, counterfeit. Right? What is he doing? He's just simply mimicking what God has already done. Jesus came in the form of God as a human being. Now Satan is trying to get someone to be in his form and notice that he was fatally wounded and somehow comes back to life. He's just mimicking what God has already done. Now there are four key parts to Satan's attempt to create this counterfeit Christ, this antichrist. The first one is wonder. Right? He is performing miraculous healing from a fatal wound, just like we saw with Jesus overcoming death. The second is worship. The one thing that Satan desperately wants is people to worship him. He hates the fact that we would worship God. That is why he is coming against us. That's why he's our adversary. That's why he is our accuser. And then the third thing you see, all dictators want to control people, and he uses his words to do it. The more you read in Revelation, you see this is the role of the Antichrist. And then fourth, you see war, right? When all else fails, just go ahead and come against God's people and wage war. So these are the tactics and what he is attempting to do through the Antichrist. 
Now, the third part of the unholy trinity is the beast from the earth. We see this in Revelation 13, verses 11 to 18. We're just going to look at a few verses that give description to this third character of the unholy trinity. So John says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and compels the earth and those who live on it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. It also performs great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in front of people. It deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs that it is permitted to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So here we have the completion now of this unholy trinity. Is it reminding you of anything? Anyone? You've got God the Father. Satan is trying to mimic and imitate him. You've got the Antichrist, that first beast of the sea, mimicking Jesus, the Son. And then you've got the prophet, the unholy prophet who is trying to mimic the Holy Spirit and trying to lead and direct everyone to worship the Antichrist, the second beast. And so uh, in this process now, you have this unholy trinity that is fully complete. And this is Satan's tactic because he is a counterfeit and he wants to mimic exactly what God has done. If you could move to the next slide. Thank you, Julie. Um, in what, what we're going to see here in just a second, I have a verse. Jesus was warning people long before this tribulation is going to happen to be careful with false prophets, be careful with signs and wonders. The people of his day just wanted signs and wonders. They wanted to have proof that God was real. But there's an element of faith that we need to trust God. And that's what he's looking for from us. But in Matthew chapter 24, a couple of verses, he had been warning his disciples about these false prophets that were to come and that have been happening in every generation since Jesus, which is why we need to know who our enemy is. Look what it says. If anyone tells you then, Jesus speaking, see, here is the Messiah or over here. Do not believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So I think the question for us this morning is, can we recognize a counterfeit? Can we recognize the real from the unreal, from who God really is, or Satan's attempts to try and draw us in and believe him or focus on him, but more importantly, not focus on God. And so Satan <laughs> is so clever, right? So I, I have a visual here for you. My wife is very big into visual props because they're very helpful, right, for us to grab concepts. And water in both uh, of these uh, vases, can you tell the difference? They both have water in them. They both look exactly the same. And for anyone who studies uh, counterfeit processes, especially with money, what do the experts tell you to do if you want to be able to recognize the counterfeit? Tell you to study the original, right? So you know exactly what that looks like. So these look exactly the same. Now, if I took some bleach and I poured it in here, does it look any different? Looks pretty much exactly the same, doesn't it? So how would you know if you were going to take a swig from this whether there was anything that could hurt me? <laughs> For those of you online, someone in the room said, don't do it. Okay. But this visual... That bleach, representative of toxins, representative of what Satan does in our life. I want you to think about the struggles that we have as human beings. I want you to think about drugs. I want you to think about alcohol. I want you to think about anger. 
I want you to think about excessive food. I want you to think about uh, unforgiveness. Think about greed and envy. Think about all of those attitudes, behaviors in our life that on the surface and initially not such a big deal. But the more we pour it into our life, right? At first it doesn't look so bad, but after a while it begins to corrode us from the inside out. This is Satan's tactic to get us away from God, to have us Think about it this way. What happens when you deal with some of the things that I've described enough, when you've dealt with the drugs and the alcohol and the gambling and the pornography and the anger and all of that stuff is rampant in your life? What happens? We start saying stuff to ourselves like, you know what? God probably doesn't love me anymore. I'm not good enough. I've made too many mistakes. Now I'm just damaged goods. I'm stupid, I'm dumb, I can't believe I gave in to that. I'm going to try harder next time. Have you heard yourself saying any of these things? Because when we do, we're buying the lie and giving in to the counterfeit instead of worshiping God, the one true God, and who he has created us to be in worship of him. So as we continue in Revelation The Apostle John is going to now describe uh, the mark that we see described here and what it means to align ourselves with Satan. And it's, again, coming through the prophet because we were last talking about him. Look at what this prophet is saying in Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18. So it makes everyone, meaning this uh, false prophet, this unholy spirit... Small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, the beast's name, the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, because it is the number of a person. Its number is 666. So here we have the prophet trying to get people to take this mark and compelling them to do this. So what is the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast is Satan's attempt. Again, it's a counterfeit. But essentially, he's wanting allegiance and ownership to him. And so this is a spiritual issue, the idea of taking a mark on oneself. And it's not about a tattoo or a microchip. I know that we can focus a lot on that. But it is real, this idea of who we align ourselves with and where we give our spiritual allegiance. Now, uh, this mystical 666, this number that we have heard, right? And in in the ancient world, it was equivalent to letters of the alphabet, and they would have numerical value, both in the Greek and in the Hebrew. And for millennia, people have been trying to figure this out, who is going to be the beast, and we can figure this out by using these numbers. And ultimately, you could make any number or name fit for this. So what is 666? Why is this important? Because we're dealing with a counterfeit, In Revelation, we see God's holy number is seven, and Satan can't use that. And so what we see is this imperfect number, his attempt to get us to align ourselves with him. And it's symbolic of the beast, this number 666, because in the Greek, the word beast adds up to 666. And in Hebrew, it adds up to all God-hating leaders, emperors, anyone who would come against God. So how then is this number 666 like a counterfeit seal? And that word seal is important because God uses it early on in Revelation to say his servants are sealed in him. But all we have to do is go back to the very beginning of the Bible, right? In Deuteronomy, we see the Shema. Shema is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, that we would write his name, right? He would seal us on his hand and forehead that we belong to God. 
And all Satan is doing is trying to take the Shema and make it an anti-Shema by giving ourselves a mark, something that would be substandard and less than God and relationship with him because that's his tactic. Now, two important words for us to recognize is we're talking about this difference of having Satan's mark or God's seal. And these are the words karagma and kerygma. Karagma in the Greek is the word for mark. Very similarly, the word kerygma in Greek is to proclaim the gospel. And wasn't that Jesus' command to his disciples that they would go and proclaim the gospel, the great commission? And what is Satan trying to get us to do? Take his mark, which would be an etching or engraving, but it is so inferior to God covering us and us belonging to him. This is God's highest and best that we would seal ourselves with him. Now, as we shift into Revelation 14, you're going to hear and see this word voices used a lot in different ways. And the first thing we see is the voices of 144,000, 144,000. So in the chapter 14 of Revelation, you are going to uh, hear about these 144,000 who have set themselves aside. They're the only ones that God uh, is going to speak through besides some of his creation. Look at this uh, verse in Revelation 14, verse 1. Then again, John is giving this Uh, description of the vision. Then I looked and there was the lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And if you keep reading Revelation uh, 14, you see that these 144,000 are singing a song that only they could sing. They were the only ones who knew it and only truth could come out of their mouths. They could not tell a lie. Their voices were being used in the purest form to worship God and God alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And then We also see, though, the voices of the angels, and there are several instances as you continue reading about angels. Here's one instance in Revelation 14, verses 6 to 7. Then I saw another angel flying high overhead with the eternal gospel to announce to the inhabitants of the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He spoke with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of the water. And as you continue reading in Revelation, that song that we sang this morning, right, that uh, we would throw our crowns down, that we would bow before him, what the angels are doing now constantly in heaven, singing holy, holy, holy. And even now we get to join in that chorus to give God our glory. So what do you do with all of this? I'd like to suggest several next steps for us when we talk about, dear church, know your enemy. Remembering this is not about what we can physically see. This is about us knowing that there are powers and principalities, forces at work. This is not about flesh and blood. This is about choices we make every day in choosing to follow God. So the first thing is resolving where are you at with God? Where are you at with God? I think there are many camps that we could fall in. There's a camp of people who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They know they are sealed in him, have relationship with him. I think there are some who don't know God. Maybe you're seeking, maybe you're interested, wanting to know more about God, but you haven't asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and not sure what that is going to be to help you take that step. And then I think you have some who are kind of in between. Uh, Maybe at one time I asked God into my life, but I've kind of drifted away, not really walking with him. So I'm not completely in the camp where I don't believe yet. So I'm maybe somewhere in between. And I think resolving where you stand is important because if you want to know who your enemy is, you have to know what team you're on. And so my encouragement to you is to resolve that this week and know that you don't have to do that alone. We would want to be able to help you answer any questions that you have. 
please reach out to us if you have those questions. Second thing you can do is repent, be baptized, and follow God. This is what the Bible says. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So any one of us can reach out and do that. There are no magic words to it. It's just simply acknowledging, I believe Jesus uh, was the Son of God, came to earth, died on a cross to forgive every one of their sins because he was the perfect sacrifice. And then he rose from the dead, proving that he was God. And so it's calling on his name, acknowledging that, and then choosing to live your life to follow him. The third thing, the way you're going to know Satan's tactics and him as a counterfeiter is you need to study God's word and know the truth. You need to know the truth. And it, you may not do it perfectly, but it's about, okay, how do I begin practicing this in my life every day? And I would encourage you, what goes right along with this is to get in a group, right? Be in community. Because I know that as I've grown over the years in studying the Bible, being in groups with people who knew a lot more about it really helped me because they helped me learn better how to study and understand it. But there's also the accountability factor that we don't have to do it alone. God didn't intend for us to do it alone. So that is a drink from a fire hose, right? We've covered a lot this morning, but my hope is that it will encourage you to want to dig into this and read this more, and more importantly, take a step to say, I want to be sealed with God, and I don't want to fall for the poison, and I don't want to allow toxins into my life that would ultimately destroy me, because that's what Satan is after. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy, and our God wants to rescue us from all of that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the truth that we see in Revelation and the picture that you give us of our enemy. And we don't have to be deceived. We don't have to be fooled. We know that there will be trouble in this life. We know that there will be hardship and pain. But thank you, Lord, that you have overcome the world. Help us to know you better, to know you more and more, and to make those choices to follow after you and you alone. We pray in the holy name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, next week, I want to make sure that you join us because we're going to be looking at Dear Church, Evil Will Not Win. Pastor Kyle said this last week, spoiler alert, uh, Jesus wins. It's not much of a fight, but it is a fight and a struggle for us, right? Now, last reminder before I let you go, moms and families, we do have picture opportunities for you. I believe there will be one uh, outside maybe, and then also over in the student ministries room, and just ask any of our wonderful people out there. They will direct you and guide you where you need to go. God bless you, and have a great day.